I'd like to say good morning and welcome to our Sunday morning Bible class. Our song selection this morning is Where the Soul Never Dies. Where the Soul Never Dies. <clears throat> Ready? Let us sing. To Canaan's land I'm on my way Where the soul never dies My darkest night will turn to day And the soul never dies No sad farewell No tears dim dies Where all is love And the soul never dies A rose is blue Meaning there for me where the soul never dies And I will spend eternity where the soul never dies No sad farewell, no tears Damned eyes Where all is love And the soul never dies Let us pray Our eternal Father and our God which art in heaven Hallowed be thy name. Father, we come unto thy throne of grace, mercy, and righteous, righteousness and justice. Thank you, Father, for the love that you have for us in this world that we live in, that you sent your son to die for our sins. We're thankful, Father, that Jesus uh, established his kingdom here on earth and that we are citizens of that kingdom. And we pray, Father, and give thanks to you for all the blessings that thou has given us both spiritually and, and physically. We just thank you, Father, for allowing us to be here this morning and waking us up last uh, this morning and letting us sleep last night and to rise to uh, be clothed in our right minds. Father, we just ask you to be with us, Brother Brown as he teaches unto us, to break unto us bread of life this morning as we continue to study uh, from your word. We pray, Father, for those that are on their way here, that they may arrive without hurt, harm, hurt or harm. And we just pray, Father, that you bless those that are here already. And pray, Father, that we be ever mindful for uh, the direction that you want to take us as far as uh, spiritually, spirituality is concerned. Father, bless those that are traveling on, on their way back home. We just ask you to be with them. And, Father, be with us throughout our day and, and this day and the rest of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Verse number three. A love light beam across the farm where the soul never dies. It shines to light the shores of home where the soul never dies. No sad farewell. Tears, dim eyes, where all is love, and the soul never dies. We are delighted that uh, those of you who are on social media are joining in with us as well. It's always a little bit more interesting, more live, more uh, interactive if we are here in person. And we encourage each of you who are not here in person with us this morning to, to try to make that your best effort and uh, your earliest convenience. 
And as we study God's word together, we hope that you have your Bible open so that we can see exactly what thus saith the Lord. As you can tell, if you're following along with us, we are nearing the end of our, of our series here in the book of Colossians. And um, the new book for First and Second Thessalonians is out. Uh, we have a copy of it here at the front if you should be so inclined to get a copy of that as we prepare to, uh, to transition from Colossians to 1 Thessalonians. Uh, I have been informed that Brother Wallace will be teaching our next series starting on, uh, on uh, next month, the month of August. I'm going to kind of be in a kind of limbo there. We'll be falling into about another th three or four lessons or classes before we uh, before we end this month, so we'll, we'll work that out as we, we move forward. Find ourselves in lesson 13, the last lesson of the book on Colossians. Uh, it deals with uh, two sections in which I will um, primarily split those in half, uh, the concluding part of it, and then there is about four or five verses right toward the first of the chapter that con is a continuation of the practical thoughts that we have been pursuing over the last uh, several weeks, last several lessons. On, uh, on last week, we, we, uh, we dealt with the, the, the lesson 12, which was the idea of, of how we are to be working in our own personal lives as far as our responsibilities to family and, and, and business relationships and so forth. Again, dealing with the practical part of Paul's instructions. If you be risen with Christ, how is it that you should be acting? What should you be doing based on the fact that you are now uh, born into the family of God, that your life has changed? You are putting off the old man. You're putting on the new man. How should your life actually change? What practical things? I know we're supposed to be walking in righteousness. We're supposed to be living in holiness. We're supposed to be uh, walking in the footsteps of Jesus. We're supposed to be following the guidelines of the master. What does that actually mean, though? And so over the, the last several weeks, we've been talking about some practical things that we have to do if we are actually risen with Christ. We need to seek those things which are above and not those things which are on this earth, which means that we should be changing some of our habits. We should be moving away from what the old man used to do. And we listed those in great detail, mortifying, uh, putting to death the members of the flesh and all the sins that are listed in chapter three, verses five uh, through, uh, through about nine. And then putting on the new man, taking on a new attitude, taking on a new way of life, uh, focusing on a new thought process. Uh, because we all know that, that in order to get the new man in actuality, in, in, in our realistic in our life, we have to be renewed. And our, our, our renewal takes place where? In the heart or in the mind, isn't it? That's correct. So you don't, you don't change direction of an individual until you change their thought process. A person who thinks a certain way will live a certain way. And if you want them to change the way they live, you got to change the way they think. Jesus did not deal with the people of his day during his earthly ministry on about moving out of certain neighborhoods and moving into better neighborhoods to change their lives. He taught them about what God wanted them to do, what God wanted them to think about and the thing, those kind of things. And so <clears throat> we, we looked at that and then we talked a little bit about family relationships and the relationship between husbands and wives and their children. And then even that is, is explained in the text about uh, slave and master relationships in which we made practical to today's uh, lives in which, you know, our, our, service to our jobs and how it is that we should be functioning on our jobs. Not like we're being watched all the time, but even in the occasions when we're not being watched because we actually serve the Lord and we don't serve, you know, 
the Jefferson County school system or, or FedEx or UPS or, or whatever company that we may work for, the mine or uh, the Social Security Department or the U.S. Postal Service, whatever job that we hold. We, we don't actually serve the boss that, that, that shows up on the job every day. We serve the Lord Christ. And so whether they're with us looking over our shoulder or whether we're functioning at home like we have over the last year or so, you know, apart from supervision, we should be able to conduct ourselves. That is if, was that, was that question, if we what? If we be risen with Christ. That's the way our thought process and our mind would, would go. And he ended up not only talking about the, the, the attitude of the person that's the subordinate, also he talked about in four, chapter 4, verse 1, that's where we closed out on last time, uh, the person who is in charge, the master, the, the supervisor, the CEO of the company. How do you treat the people that work for you and that serve you? Do you treat them with the respect and the consideration that God would expect of you? And so looking at the lesson 11, that's on page uh, 50 of your, of, of your, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, page, uh, lesson 13 on page 54 of your textbook, you will see our last lesson, lesson 13, uh, talks about more responsibilities of the new man and salutations. So we'll actually take and split those two apart and we'll deal with the, the additional thoughts on the responsibilities of the new man. And then we'll close out in the next session on the salutation, the closing remarks of the apostle Paul is they are quite extensive. And although our textbook kind of just runs over them, I think the apostle Paul mentions some things that are, that are quite interesting in his salutation, uh, which we'd like to, to cover before we get off, uh, transition into first Thessalonians. All right. With that having been said, starting with verse two, chapter four of Colossians and going down to verse six, continuing in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. With all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds. That I may make manifest as I ought to speak Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Apostle Paul's last comments, and then going you know, into verse 7, he gets into his salutations and closing remarks. So we'll focus on those, uh, those few verses, those five verses there. Uh, Paul, Paul talks about, one of the things that I would say is kind of basic in our, in our Christian life, and that is our prayers. Continuing in prayer and watching the same with thanksgiving. Pr prayer is, is, is such a basic concept in Christianity that I think a lot of times we just kind of overlook it. Uh, oftentimes our prayer life is not what it needs to be. Paul is looking at in the previous verses things that, that grow out of our spiritual nature. You know, what kind of activity should we be engaged in because we are spiritual people? And the thing he's looking more now at things that feed into our spiritual being. The things that we do that connect us more with God. Everything that, that, that we do in our bodies, our physical, uh, it, it takes a physical action. But our physical actions, as we've been pointing out, are dictated by the way we think or our spiritual relationship with God. And here he's discussing a few things that because of the actions that we do, that feeds into our spiritual being. So if we're talking about prayer. In other words, how, how strong we are spiritual, spiritually has a lot to do with how faithful we are in our prayer lives. We, we read the word of God so that God can talk to us but how often do we talk to God? And, and is it a, a scripted verbatim type recitation? You know, my grandsons, whenever Brother Cash and I go out to dinner, maybe for some time at work, you know, one of my grandsons and we'll say, all right, you pray. And, and he's, he's 14 years old. He wants to recite, you know, God is good. God is great. 
God is good. Let us thank him for our food. And we've been doing this for what? A couple of years now. And we found it. Come on, Caleb. You've you got to tell God something different. And I'm like, if you were telling your girlfriend the same thing every time you talk to her, she'd get tired of talking to you. And I mean, you've got to say something different. And, 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 and I think if we're not careful, we can fall into that same routine. You know, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, Lord, bless you, Lord, bless, Lord, bless, and, and forgive me, and, and amen. And, and that's one of the things that I pointed out in a message that I preached some time ago is that, you know, if I think a lot of times we, we struggle with, with, what do I say? You know, what do I actually say to God? You know, and, and we listen to prayers from the pulpit, and sometimes some of us brothers, you know, we, we can get kind of holy with our prayers, you know, and you probably listen to preachers on TV and so forth. And, and then if you don't say Lord just right or God in just the right emphasis, you know, you're really not really praying. And, and the fact of it is, is that public prayer is, is totally different than personal prayer. I mean, we would not suggest that any individual would get up before the congregation and pray publicly about personal issues. You know, where you go into detail with what you've done and hadn't done and how you did it, what you think about somebody, you know, because that, that could create a whole issue all by itself if you're doing it in public. But if you're privately talking to God and God, because like, God ain't going to tell about it. You can share what's really on your heart. And, and how well we do that feeds into how strong we become as a Christian in our spiritual walk. And as I mentioned, and I started to say a moment ago, one of the things I mentioned in a sermon some time ago was that if you don't know what to pray for, go back and look at some of the Psalms. Those are prayers, many of them. And you can read along with them even in your prayers. And, and, and you would be amazed at how quickly the thoughts that are expressed there can be something that will then prompt you to think about something you need to talk about on a personal basis. Paul is telling the Colossian church, in, in, in the midst of all the struggles they're going through, in the midst of all the things he's been emphasizing to them about what they need to do and how they need to avoid fornication and they need to make sure that they're talking and saying and doing all the different things. We need the private time with just us alone in God that we can talk to him about what's going on in our lives. Now, I know we know that he already knows. But sometimes it sounds different when you say it. You ever said that? You ever seen that before? When, when you know in your heart something going on, but you actually start expressing it in words. That's why it's so important sometimes if you have a very close confidant, somebody that you can really trust, that you need to sit down and talk with them about it. Some things that you're going through and struggling with. Because the hearing yourself say it makes difference. When you pray to God, if you can actually hear yourself think it, or if you need to, if you're private and at home by yourself, you can say it out loud. But the fact of that Paul is that you need to continue in prayer. We never get so old in our walk with God to where we graduate from the necessity of prayer. It's one of the basic tenements of our religious faith that we need to be praying and talking with God to make sure that we that we are expressing and sharing and communicating on an ongoing basis. And the more you do it, just like everything else, the better you get at it. The less you do it, the harder it is to start it up again. Paul goes on to point out that, that, that we need to be vigilant. The King James says, watch in the same with thanksgiving. The walk of a Christian is, is, is a, by necessity one of vigilance. Because Satan will creep up on us at any given time. And, and just about the time you think you're doing good, he'll go and attack you in a certain way that'll point out to you, you still need Jesus really bad. The moment we start thinking that we are good, Satan will show us we're not so good. Life will show up. Well, Brian and I was working on a project Friday and, uh, 
I was measuring something, and I'm always harping on, with my team about reading a ruler correctly. Well, I, I cut them wrong. I'm going to show you what my fault was. The tape measure wasn't reading right. Well, bro, when I was selling, when I was looking, I said, man, I can't believe I cut this an inch short. And he said, well, it happens. I said, but it don't happen to me. And he said, that's the problem. <laughs> the moment you start thinking it don't happen to me, the moment you defiantly stand up and tell somebody who is wrapped up in sin, I would never do something like that. Watch it, watch it, watch it. Because if we're not vigilant, that will happen to us. That will be you next time. And that's what Paul told him. He said, he said that, that you which are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. And, and then he explains why. Consider yourself. Lest next time is you, lest thou also be tempted. We, we, we have to be very vigilant in our, in our walk with God. Because you had a good day yesterday does not mean today is going to go well. Because there were no challenges that brought you to the brink of telling somebody how you really feel about them. Don't mean that today won't be a new challenge. And you'll have to call on the reserves of that prayer meeting you had with Jesus this morning to keep from being ugly. Because it, it, inside all of us, it goes back to that old that, that statement that he made in chapter 3. Mortify your members. I'm talking about that if you don't put them to death, they will rear back up and take over your life. And there's no way in the world that you'll be able to overcome it. And he says with thanksgiving, this should be a, something that is a part of our prayers on an ongoing basis. Our gratitude. And I'm not just saying, Lord, thank you for this, and thank you for that, and thank you for that. I'm so glad I got that. But the fact of it is that we with deep sense of appreciation realize just how blessed we are. Often life shows us the things we don't have. I don't have as good of this as somebody else has. I don't have as much of this as someone else has. I would like to have more than this or more of this because other folks got better stuff. And too, too often we fail to realize just how blessed we are. But Cash and I often think about how, you know, the living conditions when we were raised, when we were kids. And, and many of you probably reflect on it, how, how, how far advanced we are from the homes we grew up in. I can remember, I can remember, and this ain't stories I heard about, I can remember the outhouse and using it. I can remember boiling water on the stove so that we could bathe in hot water. I remember that. And yet now we get up and turn the faucet on and take a shower with good hot water and we don't even think about how that happened or how blessed we are and where we are. We, we've come so far and, and God has given us so much. It's kind of like some of our children, you know, they've had so much, they, they don't know the difference. It was, oh, if you took away their cell phone, it was like you would be cursing them to solitary confinement because that's all they've ever known. And yeah, I grew up without one. And it wasn't because we couldn't afford one because they didn't have them. There wasn't no such a thing. And yet we, we live in, in such a world. And, and the common blessings of food and, and clothing and, and, and opportunity to rest and, and, and wake up in the morning refreshed and start all over again. The opportunity to have a job that, that pays our bills where we don't have to be. You know, you know one thing that the Apostle Paul said uh, that, that we should be willing to give to, uh, because Jesus had stated it is more blessed to give than to receive. Yeah. It's a greater thing for you to be in a position to give than you need to be in a than you being in a position that needs somebody to give to you. It's much more blessing to be able to do that. And Paul is saying that we're continuing in prayer, being vigilant on our walk with God, and being thankful in the process. Those are things that help to to change the mind. We're talking about if we're risen with Christ, then our mind has to change in order for us. A person who has a deep sense of gratitude just lives different than a person 
who thinks folks are using them, abusing them, and, and not giving them, and they don't get in life what they deserve. Your whole attitude is different. And, you, and the people, and again, people are watching as we live our Christian life and go through our difficulties. Then Paul turns into verse three. And in addition to the idea of talking about prayer, solicits their prayers. That part of their Christian walk as the church at Colossae should be that you are promoting the gospel. And he asked for their continued prayers for him that God would open a door so that he would be able to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ even though, even though he was still in prison. How many of us, if we got put in jail, would be concerned about preaching the gospel? Writing letters to churches on the outside to, to encourage them in their walk with God. I dare say that if we got put in jail for whatever reason, we would probably be more consumed with our own issues of how we're surviving and how we can't live life and we don't have the freedom we used to have. And, and it's, you know, whether I'm wrong or innocent or, 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 or what have, those things no doubt probably consumed the Apostle Paul as well because he was put in, in jail not for, for committing murder or, or doing horrible, heinous things. He was put in jail just because he preached the gospel and they didn't like his message. And so he is saying that, that with all praying for us, that God would open a door of utterance. How often, how often do you pray that God would open an opportunity for you to speak to somebody about Jesus? How many people do you pass in, in a constant flow on a daily basis? People that you either work with, live beside, or associate with in some way. And, and have you ever asked God, would you please open a door so that I can step up and say something to them about Jesus Christ? It, it, sometimes we can just get consumed in our own daily routines and we're just living. And not thinking about the possibilities that there are some of people who live right beside us who may go to hell even though we hate the gospel of Jesus Christ right next door. You, you, we were song, we've sung that song many times. You never mentioned him to me. When before the bar I stand, some helpless soul will say, you, you never mentioned him to me. Hey, they're being cast out into out of darkness. We're walking into to the heavenly uh, blessings and, 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 and yet you, you, you met me day by day and you knew I was astray. And yet you, you never mentioned him to me. I know there are times that there are hesitations in our heart because we don't think people will receive the message. And probably they won't. Not the first time, but the second or third time we mention it to them. How many times does Satan offer us sin before we accept it? You ever seen a person offered, you know, a child who's been taught better, offered drugs, and they said, no, I don't want it. But Satan don't pack it up and go away. He keeps coming back with it again and again. And if we're that, if we're that committed to the, uh, the message of the gospel, we will the same as, as well. Uh, and, and that's not to suggest that we take the Bible and just beat people across the head with it, that we act in a condescending fashion, which we'll address here in, about, in the last verse of, of our section here of this morning. But, but that, that, but that we, we present it in a fashion, now, not saying that you can make the truth likable to people, because many times the truth in and of itself by its very nature is not acceptable and not likable to people because they don't like the truth. But oftentimes, if we're not careful, we can turn people off by our attitudes and not necessarily by what we're saying, but the way we're saying it. But Paul recognized that in his own situation in life, he still wanted to reach out. And he was doing it in this letter to the Colossian church, reaching out and promoting the gospel despite the fact that he was in jail. In verse four, he adds on that they may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Verse five, walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. 
What exactly would, would, would Paul be suggesting to the church at Colossae to walk in wisdom toward them that are without? Who are the them that are without? Okay, those are not members of the church. Those that don't know Christ. People that are without the church. Whenever he talks about people that are without, that means that they're strangers from the covenant of promise. They're, they're not part of the body of Christ. So, so we have a responsibility to them. Walk in wisdom toward them. And I think that gets into what I was just alluding to is, is the idea about how we present ourselves in front of the world. The life that we live, the, the, not just the, the message that we preach, but the life that we live. There's an old, song, uh, old poem that goes, I would rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather you would walk with me than merely point the way. Our, our ability to not only guide our children, but also to influence the world around us is the way in which we live our lives. And so Paul is saying we need to walk in wisdom. James talks about us needing wisdom and, and, and the idea that, that we often are faced with circumstances that we really don't know how to deal with. And you won't know how to deal with them until you've been through it a time or two. You don't come here automatically knowing how to resolve conflict. You know, sometimes you can get sideways with, with your neighbor. And how you resolve those conflicts will determine on whether or not they're receptive or not in, in you talking to them about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And our, so Paul's mentioning the idea of walking in wisdom that, that we, we have to be very careful that the way in which we conduct ourselves on a non-church basis is in accordance with the facts that re regulate our Christian life, the word of God. If it's not in accordance to that, and we, we think, well, because I'm not at church and I can just do this kind of thing. And how many people have gone places, done things, been involved in certain activities that, that if, if when seen by other people, you couldn't talk to them about Jesus about that because you're not in a place where you can even, you can even mention Jesus. Now, in fact, you don't even need to let them know that you know Jesus. So our lives and where we go and what we do must coincide with the, with, with the conduct that is becoming the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then, then Paul mentions the idea of redeeming the time. We hear this from time to time. Redeeming the time. What does the word redeem mean? We heard Jesus is our redeemer. Uh, he redeemed us from the curse, the Bible tells us. What does the word redeem mean? To buy back? Okay, to purchase back, buy it back. Uh, and, and so in reality, if you really think about it, you can't, you can't redeem no time. I'm about the time you've already spent is gone, isn't it? You're not buying it back. You're not getting it back. You're not getting a chance to. So in, 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 in the literal sense, the idea of redeem means to buy back or to recover from loss. Jesus did that when we were in sin. He died on the cross so that his blood could buy us. And the Bible tells us he purchased the church with his own blood. He bought us back from sin so that we could be holy again. But in, in, in the figurative sense, the idea of, of buying back or redeeming means to save from future loss, to seize opportunities so that we don't actually lose more time like we did. Notice, take a look at your... Uh, at your, uh, your, your textbook on uh, page 55 on the left-hand column. So in verse 5, redeeming the time means to buy up. That is, ransom, figuratively to rescue from loss, improve opportunity. Literally, one cannot buy back their time. This simply means that we make wise use of our time and use of our opportunities that we have. The, the NASV renders this, making most of the opportunity. The context seems to point toward the opportunities of spreading the gospel of Christ. So here Paul is saying to the Colossian church, you, you have an awesome responsibility, not just to keep your own head above water, not just to make sure that you are living the kind of life you should be living, but that you're outreaching and sharing the gospel with other people. 
We should never forget. And I know we've been through a pandemic. We've been turned upside down. Our, our lives have been flipped over. I don't know how many times over, over, over the last couple of years. And it's very easy for the church to forget that we're in the soul saving business. Sometimes we're just trying to keep from going under. And our job is to reach out and help people who are lost in sin by spreading the the message of the word of God and seizing every opportunity that we have to be able to share God's word with other people. And then notice sometimes, as I mentioned before, verse six, our attitudes can greatly affect that. We can become so hurt by life, by people in the church, by folks we know and trust, by family members, we can become jaded so that everything we say seems to be poisonous. And so Paul said, let your speech be most of the time always, always with grace. Always with, how often do we just, just, just bitterness comes through our voice. Frustration comes out of I mean, many times it's not even about the person we're talking about, talking to. But you've heard the old, the old phrase, it's a cat kicking world. You know, you've never heard of that? Well, you can't, you can't say you hadn't heard of it now. It's a cat kicking world. You've never made it. Am I the only one? That, did I just make that up? Zig Ziglar used to tell the story that this young lady was at work and her, her boss was in his office and his boss had just called him up and the numbers weren't looking right, the sales weren't going on, he's mad, he's just being chewed all out. He slams the phone down and comes out there to his secretary, who's a young lady sitting at the desk, and he says, do you got that report that I asked you for? Well, no, sir, I don't. Well, I'll tell you what, if you can't get the report like I asked you to get it, then I'll just get somebody else who can and he, you know, she, she's all tore up about it. She leaves work, she goes home, and her little son runs out the house, and he's been playing in his, his school clothes. Didn't I tell you not to play in your school clothes? I'm going to tell you, you tore those pants up again. If you do it again, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. He walks on the porch, and the poor little cat just sitting there, get out the way. <laughs> the, the fact of it is, is that frustrations tend to run down hill. You know, Poor cat didn't have anything to do with it. It's a cat kicking world. Sometimes we just, we ain't got nothing else in it. We ain't above nobody. We ain't, we don't know supervisors, nobody. We can't chew on our subordinates. So we just kick the cat. And <laughs> you thought I was going somewhere else with that? Okay. I'm <laughs> okay. But, but the idea is, is that there are times in our lives when our own personal issues are going along to where when we try to talk about Jesus, it just don't come off right. And, 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 and Paul is saying, let your speech be always with grace. Then he adds, seasoned with salt. This is not the only time the Bible mentions salt to us, does it? Jesus says what? We are the salt of the earth. What does that mean? Have you ever tried to eat food that they didn't? You know, they've gone through this big push to where you don't need to eat salt. Gives you high blood pressure. Now, I don't know how our ancestors ate salt pork and then all that. and never had a bit of high blood pressure. But maybe it's because they worked and sweated a whole lot more than we do. And we sat in front of an air conditioner. But the fact of it is, is that we've gone through this whole rigmarole about salt is going to kill you and it's going to give you high blood pressure. And so they come up with Mrs. Dash and no salt. And I can't believe it's not butter. And I'm going to tell you something. As good as those intentions are, you can tell when people ain't putting no salt in the food. You can tell. Now, I realize that some people abuse it and they start salting their food and they haven't even tasted it yet. 
But you can tell when somebody ain't salted the food. There are some times when, when you can get something that somebody has cooked for you that don't taste worth nothing, and you can hit it with a few shots of salt, and all of a sudden it, it perks up, tastes a whole lot better. That, I, don't, I don't think God was just guessing at this thing. I think he put salt here for a reason. And he says, let your speech be seasoned with salt. In other words, if we are the salt of the earth, then we should be that, that thing that brings out the flavor, the better side of things. If we're the salt of our community, we should be the healer and the helper in the community. If we are the salt of the earth, we should be making the earth better by our presence. Let me just throw this in as a bonus here. He didn't say the salt of the shaker, did he? Now see, we, we have a tendency to want to keep the salt in the shaker when we come to church and spiritual stuff. We don't want to get that salt out because you put it on meat and salt, the white pure salt turns all brown and, and soaks up the juice and, and it ain't pure no more, is it? So if we keep ourselves in the church building and we don't get out there and get in the community, we can't make it better, can we? Because the salt was not designed to be left in the shaker. It was designed to be poured out on the objects that we're trying to change. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. Paul said, let your speech be seasoned with salt. That the way you say something, the way you present Jesus Christ, the manner in which the tone of your voice in which you talk about someone who is living in sin should not be one of judgmental accusation should not be one of person looking down on someone else and beating them up because you caught them at the wrong time in their life. It should be one of trying to say, you know, we all struggle. Not that we can approve of anything you might have done, but that we're not going to kill you for it either. Because we all in our struggles of life need somebody with a sympathetic and understanding ear that not only can listen to what we are going through and give us words of comfort, but we know at the same time will still hold us to a higher standard. But they won't be ugly about it. Because nobody wants to share some intimate personal issue knowing that the person you're sharing it with is going to beat you up about it. And Paul is saying that we need to, when we're approaching other people, and I, I know for, for years in Church of Christ, we would, we would just go down the roll call, call out all the denominations. You're going to hell. You're going to hell. You're going to hell. And I'm not sure where it came from or how we thought that was helping. But if you'll notice, the apostles in their preaching, they just preached Jesus. They told about the goodness of Jesus and the expectations of our Lord and Savior and then encouraged people to come and experience it. That's what we need to be doing. And as we tone our voices to be the kind of, the, the, of, of, of expression of the voice of God, we need to call on and pull from the kindness and the gentleness and the meekness of Jesus Christ. And then the last phrase as we close here, that you might know how to answer every man. The text points out that, that, that the Greek word that's used here is every man is not talking about to everybody, but every man individually because some people need to be spoken a certain way to and others need to be spoken in a totally different way. Somebody's got a concern that they are talking about and out of a arrogant attitude. If you ever notice how Jesus dealt differently with different people? If a person had a broken heart, Jesus showed them love and affection and kindness. If a person came at him with a question from an arrogant heart, he would call them a snake and a viper and, a, and, and, and all kinds of stuff. We need to know how we answer every person individually. There's no cookie cutter presentation for the cause of Christ. We need to be able to reach that person wherever they are on whatever level they are on so that we can touch their heart with our heart and show them Jesus Christ in living form through us. Any questions or comments as we close this morning? Thank you so very much for your time and attention.
Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansion, bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. Who in the set get to heaven? What a day of rejoicing that will be. Who in the set see Jesus? Who will sing and shout the victory? Let us pray. Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for letting us get another good portion of your word. Father, we thank you for the teacher and the lesson, and hopefully that our minds have been opened, that we should always season our words with grace, no matter who we come in contact with, so it will be the example you would have us to be, O oh Lord. Father, please forgive us for where we fail you. In thy son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 